Welcome to lecture 5.4, Fixed Points and Cauchy's Theorem. To begin, let's recall the subtle difference between fixed points and stabilizers. Suppose a group G acts on a set S. Then the fixed points of this action are the elements in the set that are fixed by every group element. So if you think of a group action using my group switchboard analogy where every element in the group has a button and pressing that button permutes the elements in the in the set then the fixed points are precisely the elements in the set that are unchanged or unmoved no matter which button you push. Next, the stabilizer of an element in the set is the set of elements in the group that fix S. So the fixed points lie in the set and the stabilizer lies in the group. But both of them involve fixing elements. Here's a lemma. Let's suppose a group of prime order P acts on a set S and here's the Here's the homomorphism. Then the number of fixed points of the action is congruent to the size of the set modulo p. I'm only going to sketch the proof. Because once I draw the right picture, it'll be obvious and I'll let you fill in the details. So by the orbit stabilizer theorem, every orbit either has size 1 or size p. Remember the size of the orbits have to divide the size of the group, which in this case is a prime p. And primes only have two divisors, one and themselves. Here on the right is a picture of the action diagram. And since every orbit has size 1 or size p, there are some number of size p orbits here, possibly 0, but let's just say some number of them. And then everything else is a fixed point. So let's count up the number of these points and compute the remainder, modulo p. Well, what is that? Well, all of these things are p, so they contribute 0 mod p. And what we have left over is the number of fixed points. And that's what the lemma says. It says the number of these fixed points, modulo p, is equivalent to the size of the set, which is the number of the total points here, modulo p. And hopefully you can see why that's true just from the picture. Again, I'll let you fill in the details if you want to write this up formally. Now, we will apply the lemma that we just learned to proving the following theorem, something known as Cauchy's theorem. This says, if P is a prime number dividing the order of a group, then the group has an element of order P. So this doesn't seem particularly relevant to anything that we've done so far. And indeed, this is one of those many theorems that we're going to see whose proof follows once we set up a very clever group action. So this is the power of group actions. To begin, I'm going to define a very, perhaps surprisingly unusual set. So my set, instead of calling it S, I'm going to call it P, capital P. It is a set of ordered P tuples of elements from the group whose product is the identity. So in other words, I'm looking at things like this p-tuples of group elements whose product in that order, x1, x2, up to xp, is the identity element. So observe that the number of these, or the size of the set, is the order of g to the p minus 1. And the reason is because we can freely choose the first p minus 1 elements however we want to. And so we have we have the number of G choices for X1. We have the number of G choices for X2. And then we have the order of G choices for XP, so forth. So this is how many choices, G to the, the order of G to the P minus 1, we have for the first P minus 1 entries. And then the last one is forced. And it, it should be clear why it's forced and also why why there always is one, because 
XP is just the inverse of the product of these. Now the group ZP, the cyclic group, acts on our set by cyclic shift. That means we have a homomorphism from ZP to the permutations of P. And we're going to define it as follows. So we take a P-tuple, X1 up to XP, and when we apply the permutation phi of 1, in other words, when we press the 1 button, that's going to take this tuple and take this first element or this first entry and stick it at the end. So we get this tuple. And notice that this works because if this is an element, x1 up to xp, an element in p, then the cyclic shift of it is as well. And we can see why that is because x1 is the inverse of x2 up to xp. So these things are inverses. And so if we multiply that element and its inverse in the opposite order, we get the identity as well. Let's look at the orbit structure of this action. So the elements of our set P are partitioned into orbits, of course. And by the orbit stabilizer theorem, the size of some orbit, say the orbit containing S, is, well, it's the order of the group divided by the order of the stabilizer. In other words, just the index of the stabilizer in the group. And that divides the order of the group, which is prime. Therefore, the size of any orbit has to be either 1 or p. But observe that the only way that an orbit containing this element could have size 1 is if every entry is the same. In other words, x1 equals x2 all the way up to xp. Well, clearly, here's an element that has an orbit of size 1. Here's a fixed point. Just stick the identity in every entry. Cyclically shifting that fixes it, so the orbit containing it has size 1. However, if we exclude this p-tuple, p -tuple, then there are this many other elements in p. The order of g to the p minus 1 minus one other elements in P. And these are partitioned into orbits of size one or size P. Now, what do we know about this number? Well, so P divides the order of G. So this number here, the order of G to the P minus one, is a multiple of P, right? So let's well, let's suppose that oops that the order of g is I don't know p to the k times m where m is some other number then the order of g to the p minus one equals p to the k m to the p minus one I don't know what this is but it, well I do know what this is it's p to the k times minus 1 is not really that important, p minus 1, it is certainly a multiple of p, right? I mean, here's a bunch of powers of p that divide it, so this thing is a multiple of p. Therefore, if we take that thing and subtract 1 from it, it is not a multiple of p. Now, since p does not divide this number, these are the remaining elements in the set, then there must be some other orbit of size 1. Because there's no way that these elements can be partitioned into a whole bunch of orbits of size p because p doesn't divide the number of these elements. Therefore, there is some other fixed point, in other words, some other p-tuple of this form, x, x, and so forth, p times, where x is not the identity element, and such an element, by definition, satisfies x to the p equals the identity. And that's exactly what we had to prove. Remember, Cauchy's theorem says that if p is a prime number dividing the order of g, then our group g has an element of order p, and there is our element. 
An easy corollary of Cauchy's theorem is that if p is a prime number dividing the order of a group, then that group has a subgroup of order p. And that's just because, well, there's an element of order p, an element x, and that will generate a cyclic subgroup of order p. Now, this seems a little bit trivial, but we will actually prove something stronger in the next couple of lectures when we study the CELO theorems. We will actually show that if p is a prime number dividing the order of a group, then g has a subgroup of every power of p, which divides the order of the group. And that's a lot stronger thing. So you can think of this sort of as the base case of the CELO theorems, which we will do shortly. Note that just by using the theory of group actions and the orbit stabilizer theorem, we have already proven the following deep results in group theory that seem to have nothing to do with group actions. First of all, Cayley's theorem. Every group G is isomorphic to a group of permutations. Secondly, the size of a conjugacy class divides the size of the group. And Cauchy's theorem. If P divides, I should say, the order of the group, then the group has an element of order P. So group actions are pretty powerful things. Let's finish with an application of what we just learned. Let's classify all the groups of order 6. By Cauchy's theorem, every group of order 6 must have an element, let's call it A, of order 2, and an element, let's call it B, of order 3. Clearly, G is generated by this A and B. But why? There just aren't that many elements. There's only six of them. If you don't believe me and you want a picture, well, here you go. G must have a Cayley diagram that looks like the following. So it's got the identity. It's got B. It's got B squared. Then we come back to the identity. It's got A, which has order 2. This is a double arrow. And then, well, from A, we can apply B. I get AB, and we can apply B again to get AB squared. And then if we apply B again, we get back to A, because B cubed is the identity. So just by knowing there's an element of order 2 and an element of order 3, we know that we have this part of the Cayley diagram. So there's not much left to do. And it is now easy to see that up to isomorphism, there are only two groups of order 6. Here's one of them. We could, of course, finish these last two missing edges, just make them both vertical. And now we get C2 cross C3. It looks like this. Or we could cross these two, like this. And then we get a group that has a Cayley diagram that is the same as the one of D3. And that's it. Now we don't have anything else we can do. So by Cauchy's theorem, we've classified all of the groups of order 6. And this is something that you may have thought of until now that, well, we've seen C6 and we've seen D3. Are there any other subgroups of order 6? Maybe you've tried to construct one, and now we have a definite answer with a firm proof. The answer is no.